I've been asked if folks could turn off their phone or silence it, uh, that would be very much appreciated. So hello and welcome. I am, we are really excited to see so many people gathered to talk about innovations, specifically things that we can do like learning lean processes and understanding how to make those critical connections that are so important to making that innovation come to life and be commercialized and deployed. So today's event is roughly split into two segments. We've got the formal presentations that are going to be held here in the auditorium, and that'll roughly take about an hour. And then we will break out and uh, move off to the left, to the rooms off to the left, and that's where we will have the informal discussions with exhibitors as well as our networking session. So what we're really hoping is that you walk away today strengthening those connections you already have and hopefully making some new connections that are fruitful for the future. So with that, I'm going to bring my colleague Artie up to introduce the first speakers. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Artie Santanam, and I'll be speaking in a little while and explaining what MRI is and what we do. But I wanted to welcome you all here first and introduce our next two speakers. Um, this is part of our new programming called MI Pop-Ups that we have. We are going to. We are um, starting off with SJF, but we are going to be having many of these pop-ups across Maryland, across our partner universities. And I would encourage all of you here to continue to engage with us and attend the other pop-ups as well. They will all be of a a slightly different flavor each time. But the idea of the MI pop-ups is to bring the innovation ecosystem together, have enough coalitions between, collisions between our innovators and our serial entrepreneurs and our investors to try and create new ventures and really truly um, you know, expand our um, entrepreneurial ecosystem um, in Maryland and beyond um, into this region. So welcome all. Um, I would, I'm going to start with two presentations from two of my colleagues. These are partners that I work with closely, starting with Bob Story. He serves uh, on the uh, governor's, Maryland Governor's Life Science Advisory Board. He's, in fact, the vice chair, serves with me in that. And he's also been involved with the MI program and the entrepreneurial ecosystem for a long, long time. He is going to present to you about the MedTech um, accelerator that he runs at, um, at uh, called the Launchport. And followed, following Bob, we'll be listening, uh, we'll be hearing from Dan Kunitz. He brings in um, the business aspects of um, taking your technology and creating a venture. And how do you, uh, how do you create that startup? What, do you, what goes into uh, creating your business canvas and getting your technology from the bench to the market. And so, Bob, I hand it over to you. So thank you, everybody. My name is Bob Story. Uh, I'm going to tell a little bit of a story about uh, translation and how the ecosystem has grown here in the area. I'm going to put up a uh, kind of a gra graphical CV, because I do wear a lot of hats. As, as already said, I'm the managing partner of a venture uh, development center in ba Baltimore focused on medical devices, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And I do have an economic development cap because I'm the vice chair of the Life Science Advisory Board, and we've had a number of initiatives that have driven a lot of the translation that's been occurring in the region. Um, I'm also a portfolio executive for RADx. If you're familiar with the diagnostics investment program, about a billion and a half dollars that we've been embarking on the past 30 months or so. And that involvement with NIH extends to a lot of the areas in i as well. So I have, I'm the i instructor for NIH's medical devices programs. Dan and I have worked a long time together on those programs, and that's another reason why I'm here. Uh, the, the final reason is the, the TEDCO relationship, and I'm an executive in residence with Johns Hopkins and have been their advocate, have been the site miner in this MII program to advocate for technologies that go through that program. And I think I'm close to about 100 programs funded over the past 10 years with that program. So we're really excited uh, that you're getting engaged with this whole TEDCO MII process, which Artie, of course, will talk uh, much more about. Um, I just want to, at the start, touch on a couple of things about this ecosystem that we have. We all know we have tremendous resources in our capital region. 
uh, in Maryland that uh, provide us a fantastic pipeline of, uh, of opportunities that we can support, probably second to no one in the country in terms of the pipeline of technologies that we have to work with. But we're not immune to this idea of the valley of death. Dan will talk a little bit about the valley of death, but I'll translate that to you into terms I can relate to. I'm a bit of a boater. And uh, generally, when people are starting with translation, they think about spin outs and startups, they think it's going to be the yachts in the Bahamas, right? It's all going to be a party. It's going to be great. But the reality is almost all the startups are boat fires, right? And a lot of the support that we've been generating out of the, out of the area and these translational programs are to reduce this risk of actually disastrous end to startups and translation. And again, we'll talk more about that as we go on during the course of the day. One of the things that we started to focus on in our region was to see how we could bring together a whole series of both federal, state, and, uh, and, and city programs and institutional programs that would help build our community, create a common language that everybody can relate to, uh, ensure that we've got an ecosystem that people can lean on each other in the process. And so we have merged a lot of these programs that have linkages with a lot of the programs that have created this, uh, this ecosystem. And it's really refreshing. I was in a meeting, uh, many of you know, Upsurge in Baltimore, which is uh, an Equitech initiative that uh, Baltimore has, has promoted. And uh, in this conversation, I heard people that I didn't know talking about the importance of customer discovery. You've got to have customer discovery before you pitch. And it's so great to hear everybody talking that same language. And we hope that if you're not talking that yet, we're going to bring you into the fold in that process. The, um, the interrelationship of these programs then have materialized into some very real opportunities for people to get funding. These, these institutional beginning i -Corps program and lean startup programs oftentimes are support for the companies or the innovators that apply to the MII program, and that program strengthens them in terms of dealing with a national i -Corps program or a national innovation program and prepares them in turn for SBIR and federal funding and then from there for, for venture funding. So this is all very integrated, very interrelated during the, uh, uh, with the use of these different programs we've developed locally. But we do have some challenges in Maryland, uh, in the DC area as well. It's, a lot of it has to do with the development of executive experience or managerial talent. Um, once these, these companies come out of, uh, of the institutions, either the federal or the, uh, the university institutions, and we have some lack of uh, continuity with manufacturing and uh, supply chain support, additional capabilities that are necessary for any of these companies as they come out of incubation can uh, sustain themselves, scale, and stabilize uh, in the future. And so what's happened for many years is these companies or these innovators would spin out and they would leave. We'd have a fantastic incubator program and then they would leave. They go to Pittsburgh, they go to, to Boston, they go to Cleveland, wherever. And that was a real problem for us. So one of the reasons that we focused on better infrastructure is if you can keep people stabilized here, even if there's an acquisition, that, that talent, those personnel resources stay in the area. They have their kids in school. Uh, they're available for the next round of innovation that comes. And that's what builds an ecosystem. That's one of the building blocks that builds that ecosystem. The Life Science Advisory Board uh, did a, a, a look at the med tech space. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm a medical device person, so that's really my focus area. And we have been uh, looking at how we can en enhance the reputation of Maryland as a, a test bed for device and medical technologies, promoting the centers of excellence that we have in the area, um, expanding collaborations with the FDA and NIH for these companies and recruiting sort of global med tech events into the area. And there's some great things that are happening this upcoming year. I'm not going to go into all of them here because we don't have enough time. But we have accomplished many of those goals in, in terms of establishing uh, new hubs and also bringing national events in the med tech space into the, into the city and into the, the state. There is a problem with, uh, that, was, that started the process for Launchport, and that was what happens after incubation for these companies. How do you get them stable, that they stay around and they contribute to that ecosystem? Because incubation is only a very early step in the process. There's uh, learnings that the innovators have to go through in terms of uh, adoption processes, in terms of their revenue and reimbursement models. How do you build your, your product in a compliant way? And so we were approached um, in 2018 
to try and find a solution for these companies in the med tech space that were emerging from incubation and needed to be stabilized and have resources and infrastructure here. Um, it's a unique model that I'm going to describe in just a couple minutes here. Uh, it's located in Port Covington or the Baltimore Peninsula in, in Baltimore. And what it focuses on is um, a site where the residents are innovation companies just past incubation. They're starting to do clinical trials or they may have FDA approval and starting to, uh, starting to deploy. Um, but at that same site, we have a contract manufacturing operation. So it's sort of a tenant, uh, anchor tenant operation of, of medical device manufacturing with a dozen companies or so, startup companies, who are in residence. They have their engineering space. They're, they're going through their process of getting products on the market. And they can not only observe what it takes to actually operate a manufacturing, a medical device manufacturing operation, but they have boots on the ground experience that they can touch and they can talk to and they can think about their own process. And so we call it a med tech pilot plan for good manufacturing processes. And that's the nature of what the launch board has evolved to over the years. It's, it's a facility, it's 27,000 square feet. We've got uh, um, assembly operations, clean rooms, sterilization processes within the facility. Um, shared meeting spaces, almost everybody in there has gotten probably Series A funding. They're at the same stage, so this interaction with folks is really strong in terms of sharing uh, best practices. Uh, and they have access to experienced medical device commercialization folks. It's not just a consultancy. We actually actively are putting products on the market and gives people a, a real-life example and model for how they need to develop their own business and become stable, uh, if they expand out of that center, we hope that they're staying in the area. They're opening a facility in, at the airport or in Hunt Valley or in PG County or wherever it might be, but they stay in the area, their talent stays because they've been stabilized, they've gotten committed to the area, and they have a big support system there. Um, we have a, a model that's very similar to what you're going to hear in terms of the first steps of, of uh, the i process that Dan will talk about. We start with making sure that our folks have a very clear patient indication, a very clear beachhead that they use to identify the really critical stakeholders that are in their, uh, in their sector. And from that, um, the, the critical elements that are necessary to get to adoption with their uh, target stakeholders is uh, matured and exercised. They actually are able to go forward and demonstrate um, a number of demonstration models to get their product onto the market. And all of that, this, this model you see on the screen is the, uh, is the comprehensive approach. It's an AdvaMed, for those of you who are familiar with the Trade Association for Medical Devices, that we use as a model when we're looking at, uh, at the development and the expansion of translational technologies in the medtech space. So uh, with that, uh, I love Sam Clemens. And I think a lot of this is about the ability of experiencing things that you haven't experienced before. And a lot of things that my colleague here, Dan, will talk about is this process that you get out, you start to try, you start to learn in, uh, as, you, as you take the next step in innovation. And so you learn what it's like to pick a cat up by the tail. So I'm going to introduce Dan Kunitz, who's uh, a colleague, longtime friend. We probably go back 10 years in, the, in working together in various i areas, and it's a real pleasure to have Dan here today and turn the baton over to you. Okay? Thank you. Thanks. All right, I thought I had a lot of job titles. Um, yeah. This one's yours. <laughs> Tough act to follow. Uh, so thrilled to be here um, and uh, look forward to meeting all of you. Uh, we will be taking questions and chatting with all of you afterwards, uh, you know, when we're out in the main area in an hour from now. Um, I run a program called i here in Maryland and throughout the Mid-Atlantic. I have several job titles. I think the one that's sort of the anchor and most central is running this program called the uh, Mid-Atlantic i Hub, which I'll talk about in a moment. I want to put i into perspective and explain sort of how we got to where we are, what the program is, what we try to do. Bob mentioned this concept of the valley of death. And those of us who work in this space around innovation are very familiar with it, where researchers on the far left of the screen here uh, have access to more support and more resources in the early stages. And as they move to the right through the commercialization path, they have less and less resources until they make that leap 
out into the commercial sector. And as they get revenue and as they grow, they have access to more and more funding. They can demonstrate traction and they can talk to angel investors and then they can talk to venture capitalists and then they can talk to, they can actually get loans um, and have strategic partnerships. But bridging that valley of death is a really critical goal um, for those of us who want to support innovation and technology transfer. And the ways we used to solve this problem before i was to find creative ways to bring people from industry to our labs. My appointment's in the engineering college at University of Maryland. And we try to bring people to schools like that and to places like this and see the value of what we're doing. And i started with this idea that maybe there's a new way where we can more proactively push our researchers and our innovations out to identify the problems, explore them, map them out, build business models around them, and engage with industry more proactively. And that's what led to i -Corp. Now, we have a very deliberate focus on who we're trying to support. We conceptualize of these early stage innovators, technology entrepreneurs, as startup founders. And we consider a startup to be a small team of innovators who are looking to solve a problem. And we draw a very deliberate distinction between startups who are searching for a business model, searching for a path to market, and companies who are already executing. And one of the problems that we try to solve is not building the ship before we've understood what the plan is. We don't want to over-engineer, we don't want to over-plan, but we want to emphasize the need to search for that path before we get out and start to build companies. We also are very cognizant of all of the problems that startups have and why they fail. And there's been a tremendous amount of research in the last couple of decades that historically we couldn't benefit from. But with the explosion of startup activity, tech startups, software startups, all the activity in Silicon Valley, all the great research being done in business schools, we now know way more than we ever did about why startups fail. Many entrepreneurs think that if they just had the money and they had the right technology, then they can get to market and succeed. And the reality is that study after study shows that although those problems are real, and you can certainly fail because of lack of funding, the number one problem is a lack of product market fit. And study after study will show that. So we want to solve this problem of getting ahead of ourselves, building companies before it's too early, and make sure that we have a product market fit before we launch the company. Really, really important for every deep research innovative startup that we've been involved in. So it leads to this paradigm that i is built on. And it's a Bob alluded to lean startup. We use the lean startup principles where we encourage our researchers and our technology entrepreneurs to start in search mode and do customer discovery and build a granular level of detail, well-informed data-driven model of how they can scale this operation before they start executing. And that's exactly what i -Corps does. So National Science Foundation started this program called Innovation Core, or i -Corps for short, in 2011. It started kind of small, and it has exploded. They feel like they have lightning in a bottle. It has grown in many ways, and I'll talk about that a little bit. At the core, i -Corps is entrepreneurial training for researchers. And our goal is to improve the odds of success of the people who come through the program, and also increase the impact of their success. And there's been a lot of research on i -Corps and a lot of metrics that I'll share with you briefly. There were many different ways that i -Corps was rolled out in the early days. And uh, as with anything, some cracks in the foundation started to appear as it scaled so drastically. And so they stepped back a few years ago. Initially, they had different kinds of programs to fund universities and fund researchers. I was involved in all of them, and Bob was involved in all of them, and I ran some of them. A few years ago, they sunset some of the previous mechanisms that they had, and they introduced a new way of running i -Corps, which is a hub. It's a way to delegate the control of i -Corps to large regions around the country so that the folks at Na National Science Foundation, there's only a couple of them running this whole program, could delegate to people like me and run innovation programs in a region. So we applied for this. We were one of the first five hubs awarded last year. We're the Mid-Atlantic Hub. It's the second one down on the right column here led by me and some colleagues at the University of Maryland in College Park. And there's four others around the country, and now there's about, uh, now there's 10. So these are the universities that we put together 
to run i in the Mid-Atlantic. It's an awesome group of research universities. Um, and actually, this list of universities, the annual research expenditures of these 10 universities totals to be about 10% of all the research expenditures in the entire country, which is pretty staggering. We only cover about 4% of the country geographically. And I'm not talking about all the amazing federal research done in this area, I'm not talking about all the other amazing universities in this area that aren't on the list. I'm just talking about these 10. And we're adding universities every year to the hub. So this is the group of universities that's sort of my day job, working with this group and running collaborative programs around customer discovery and lean startup throughout this region, working really closely with these and with others. There's a longitudinal study going on uh, by NSF to research the impact of i -Corps. They have to report to Congress under the AICA, uh, American Innovation Competitiveness Act, every uh, two years. So this data only goes to 2020 because it's the most recent I have. We're wrapping up the 2022 data, and I'll get that soon and report on it. So this data is already three years old. Uh, but it shows we're already, it says teams trained 1,900 at a national level. We're already up to 3,000. In fact, we'll be at 3,000 in a month. Um, and we have worked with many startups and had fantastic outcomes. Our goal, 1B, goal 1B, I would say, is to launch startups. But 1A, which is more important to those of us who run the programs, is to embed a culture of innovation in our research institutions. We also have a lot of research that we're doing to track the effectiveness of how well we're doing that. Do the participants inform their teaching with the concepts when they're teaching to their students? Um, do they report on positive impact on their career? Um, and so, uh, huge success. And following on that, Congress about six years ago passed the American Innovation and Competitiveness Act saying that i should be taught to researchers funded by all federal agencies, not just National Science Foundation. Started at NSF in 2011. In 2016, they said everybody should do this. NSF collaborates particularly closely with NIH and DOE. Bob is especially involved in NIH. I'm especially involved in DOE. Um, but it's also um, at DOD and USDA and NASA and on and on. Uh, more recently, just about six months ago, the Chips and Science Act was passed. You can see the third bullet point down. Uh, NSF got a ton of money um, to expand innovation and entrepreneurship and industry collaboration programs. They started a new directorate called TIP, um, which is one of the biggest changes at NSF, I would say, um, in, uh, since I've been around in the last 10 years. i moved into the new directorate. SBIR moved into that new directorate. Lots of great new programs coming out of that directorate to fund innovation in these kinds of activities. Very, very exciting. And there's a lot of other great things going on. Uh, we've been involved in ministries of science and technology from other countries, see what's going on with i and they want to stand that up. So Bob and I have been to India together. We've been to Brazil together. We've been to Japan. I've been to Mexico, on and on. Lots of, lots of great stuff going on outside our borders. Our focus is really you know, here in Maryland. And what I do want to emphasize that Although this is really fun, I care about building an innovation ecosystem here in Maryland, first and foremost. I got kids in school here. This is my home. I work at University of Maryland. And I was really fortunate to get support from Artie at TEDCO, from the EDA federally, from other partners in the, um, in the region, including the University System of Maryland, to spread these programs regionally and to teach i to participants at underserved um, universities, uh, HBCUs, other minority serving institutions. Um, and so we built with that funding and support the Maryland Innovation Extension, which we just launched last year. And we are scaling i more than we ever have before throughout the state of Maryland. And I'm hoping that that can be sort of the beginning to the collaborations that, um, that will spin out of what's going on here today. Happy to talk about that more later. Um, so just real fast how it works, we have regional programs, participants of NSF's national program get $50,000 grants from NSF to go through these customer discovery boot camps, engage with industry, engage with stakeholders, map out, um, you know, that business model, um, and do that on the way to getting MII or SBIR or whatever um, funding is available to them in their region. This is my last slide, just a quick comment on the process. We view what we do as bringing the scientific model to entrepreneurship. 
And on the left, we have a business model canvas, um, which allows the researchers to develop hypotheses around the value of what they have. And we encourage them to test those hypotheses by talking directly with stakeholders in a really rigorous, methodical way. I just collapsed seven weeks of content into about 10 seconds. I'm happy to answer more about that later. Um, these are my three job titles um, and my email address at the bottom. Happy to answer questions uh, later on and happy to uh, you know, just reach out to me. I've got a zero inbox policy, so I'll get back to you. And with that, very happy to introduce Artie. Reintroduce Artie, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Dan. So I hope that you guys are getting excited listening to both Bob and Dan and some of the ways that we interact uh, and collaborate with both of those groups. But there are other groups in this room as well that we interact with and we hope to see them at future MI pop-ups. Um, to explain what MI itself is, now I've been saying MI since I got up here, but what MI stands for is Maryland Innovation Initiative. Um, this is an initiative that was created about 12 years ago um, by the legislature, uh, by the uh, Maryland legislature. Um, and our mission is to accelerate support and support the commercialization of promising technologies from bench to market through investments in innovation, entrepreneurship, and venture creation. And venture creation being one of the bigger outcomes that we look for, one of the bigger metrics that we follow. And, and you can imagine how both Bob, um, Bob's launch port as well as the ICO program is so crucial for us to make success, have successful venture creation happen in Maryland. MI is one of the many programs under our company, TEDCO's umbrella. TEDCO is an instrumentality of the state. Most of our funding comes from the state. Um, and our mission is to enhance economic um, empowerment by fostering an inclusive and entrepreneurial innovation ecosystem by identifying, investing in, and helping grow technology and life science, um, com life science companies in Maryland. Um, and you will be hearing from TEDCO CEO Troy Lamal Sto Stowell in a few minutes, and he'll talk about the larger, the bigger picture of how TEDCO does what we do. We've been doing it for 24 years now. We have many different funds under our umbrella, as you can see from this graphic here. Some of those funds are given out as grants. Some others are actual investments, and we go all the way from pre-seed to Series A and even up to Series B investments. Um, and we have many of my colleagues in the room that are um, that can talk to each of those funds and how uh, we give out those funds and how we also layer on top of these funds, we also layer an um, ecosystem empowerment um, uh, support services um, and we connect people to resources that they may need uh, to grow their companies, to help grow and scale their companies. MI, um, our process itself is to, uh, to be innovative, to innovate seed and grow um, technology-based um, startups coming out of the university system. Um, the universities that we collaborate with are on this um, on the slide here. Uh, the five research universities, um, Johns Hopkins University also includes the uh, FFRDC APL that is part of Johns Hopkins, and so we get JHU APL also brings their technology through our program, as well as the comprehensive universities Bowie State and Frostburg. And uh, our annual funding from the state is. $6.1 million, the state, the uh, universities are pay, are, it's a pay to play fund, so the universities put in some funding into the pot as well. Um, for, we have had MI has been in existence since um, 2012, so this is our 10th year. And in the 10 years that we have been uh, working at it, we have invested $48 million dollars um, looked at 875 applications, given out 420 awards, created 146 startup companies that have then gone on to raise over $700 million in follow-on funding. The interesting part of the follow-on funding metric is that it is, um, most of it, 80% of it, is from 
VC and angel groups, sophisticated fundings, and it is um, raised within two years of the company formation. The companies have, the technology has been de-risked and strengthened to the point where by the time we, in, uh, we create these companies, they are ready. They are ready and talking and trying to raise more additional fundings for their um, technology um, development. The program is actually a very interesting program. We have, um, we have the technology partners, of course, from the universities, but we have our secret sauce, which is the site miners. Bob is one of our um, site miners from the beginning of the program. But these are folks like Bob um, that are mining each of our university sites for technologies that are um, just ripe for commercialization. And by just ripe, I mean that they are either going through the i program or willing to go through the i program. The technology is not back of a napkin idea. They are looking to find that market, product market fit, and that's when they are bringing those technologies through our funding program. We do have a board that has oversight over our uh, funding program and we have a very small staff, but our extended um, extended teammates in reviewers and site miners take on a lot of the load of running this program itself. Um, the program approach goes through multiple different aspects of what TEDCO as an overall organization does, but this is uh, within the program. We do outreach and awareness to raise awareness about the programming. We do engagement and education, as you, had, as you have experienced today. We do funding, obviously, because that is our core mission, is to fund technology development, market assessment, and commercialization planning. And in the investments, once we have a venture created, we do investments in the venture and accelerate the commercial readiness level. There are two phases to how we do investments. One is the grant phase, which is at the early stage. We do investments in the principal investigator who is the researcher in the universities. The success metrics for this program is to see if the technology is de-risked for a product market fit. And in the process, they also go undergo an i programming to create a business plan and a licensing opportunity. Um, the the pro project could then get licensed or get spun out into an uh, into a uh, into a M Maryland startup. Um, we have a thirty percent startup formation um, success rate, which is pretty high, uh, because partly because of all of the efforts that we put in in the grant phase to really de-risk the technology. Um, these startups then are uh, the success metrics. We do investments up to th three hundred thousand dollars in these startups. And the success metrics for these um, startups is the follow-on funding and the company growth and the regulatory success and revenue generation. Um, I said revenue generation because not all MI funds are for life sciences, although majority of our funding is for life sciences. The fund itself is actually technology agnostic. So we have funded everything from life sciences to health IT to aerospace, cybersecurity, ag bio, and other industries. But here are a few of our companies, some of them, some of which are going to be exhibitors outside today. Please talk to them, talk to them about the process, MI process, what you like about it. Talk to them about their products and how they want to develop it. There are some of them would love to develop those products for the warfighters, so there may be co-development opportunities there as well. This is my team. There's one other member that's been recently added to my team. She's not here right now, but um, we have to take a picture with her. But um, it's a very small team, and but we are all passionate about uh, you know entrepreneurship. Please reach out to us, talk to us. We are all available, and we'll answer your emails. And finally, I want to leave you with some of the uh, some of the other partners that we are working with to create a regional hub. Uh, we are working with Johnson and Johnson, J Labs. We are working with AURP, our AURP partners in the room, and Children's National as well. We are trying to create a regional hub for innovation um, and um, entrepreneurship, and we are so happy to welcome SJF into the fold and to add your name to our partnership um, partnership list here. And with that, I'll hand over to LaShawn. Well, thank you. 
Already, and uh, thank you everyone for joining this event and uh, welcome to HJF. For those of you who are just learning about HJF for, and visiting us for the first time, a very special welcome to you all. Uh, we are very excited, um, but I'm going to keep my comments brief because I know everybody is about ready to go have food and networking. But I will give a brief overview for uh, folks benefit about who we are, what we do, and what we envision our collaboration with MII to be. So thank you uh, to Artie and Tedco MII for allowing us to host this networking event. Um, uh, we have very big high hopes for uh, what com what's to come. So let me get started. So HJF was authorized by Congress in 1983 by Senator uh, legislation sponsored by uh, Senator Henry M. Scoop Jackson, as he was known on the Hill, who was a staunch supporter of both medical research and the military, and sponsored the creation of HJF to further uh, mi military medical research and education. So today, our organization is one of the largest nonprofits in the DC area and we operate globally, but our mission remains the same. We partner to advance military medicine for the nation's war fighters. And although our initial legislation specifically called out our partnership with the Uniformed Services University, we have now grown over 40 years and we've grown our capabilities and we now partner with almost all of the services under DOD, uh, other federal labs like NIH and CDC, as well as academia and industry. Under our HJF brand, we have now three fully owned and operated subsidiaries. Our MRI subsidiaries operate internationally while Camrus operates both domestically with offices here at Rockledge and internationally. Um, together as an as a organization, we currently manage nearly 14,000 research projects and programs and over 1,200 clinical protocols across 45 states and 18 countries, including multiple sites in East Africa and Southeast Asia. You'll see that our research areas are broad. The areas in which we partner are very broad. They traverse both military and civilian medicine. And what HDF does is we provide uh, subject matter expertise and capabilities in areas ranging from uh, proposal development and submission, uh, program management and operational support and staffing, as well as technology transfer and commercialization. And you'll see several of our uh, HJF supported programs uh, out in amongst the exhibitors in the pop-up. So please visit with them and find out more about our work in combat casualty care, infectious disease, um, and oncology. And I, I definitely recommend you, you meet with them. You would be hard pressed to find uh, professionals that are more dedicated to their mission uh, than, than those of us, our HDF teammates here. Um, so you'll learn a lot more than this brief overview. But I just wanted to focus very quickly on one of the significant uh, impacts of the work, the partnering work that we do, and uh, the means by which, one of the means by which we advance our mission. And that is through the provision of very innovative scientific subject matter experts and our Office of Technology Transfer, including our joint Office of Tech Transfer with the Uniform Services University. Uh, that office started in 2000, um, and over the last 23 years, um, we have seen 37 products brought to market uh, based on technologies that were developed within our DOD partner labs. So that's, we've done okay, but we feel we can do much better. And so we're really excited about um, our partnership with TEDCO because we're really looking to be a part of the in ecosystem and build an ecosystem for military medical innovation and commercialization. And we, you know, we believe that we can partner with TEDCO and hope to develop new programs that are based on the success of the MII model that will bring together um, our local entrepreneurs and in investment with our innovators within military medicine. 
So the goal there will also be to move innovations developed within the military medical research community out with, that have dual use applications to move those out into out of our partner labs and into Maryland life science companies and startups, as well as bringing innovations from our local ecosystem in, into our labs and help validate the military relevance of those applications. So our intent is to foster collaboration and engagement of key stakeholders earlier in the development process and the innovation process and improve the commercial viability of the concepts as well as ensure that product development stays aligned with both the military relevant requirements as well as the commercial market needs. So we're really excited to be partnering uh, with TEDCO to better align our innovators, our um, uh, development capabilities that are in the region, and public and private investment so that we can drive more products, accelerate the delivery of products to our nation's warfighters. So I'm going to stop there and ask uh, Dr. Caravallo to come up and give a few brief comments. He's our president and CEO. Give some comments on our partnership. Uh, thank you, LaShawn. Uh, uh, thank you for that uh, great uh, introduction to uh, HGF. Well, I join my colleagues in welcoming uh, you all here to today's events. And I want you to know that on behalf of HGF, I'm fully supportive of the partnership uh, we're formally establishing here today. Now, both TEDCO and HGF uh, have corresponding mandates, and we overlap in, the, in our uh, interests uh, to facilitate the advancement of medicine and that aspect of life sciences and entrepreneurial work within the state and the U.S. military, respectively. The agreement today uh, that we'll sign shortly culminates long discussions and negotiations with the realization that our complementary strengths can indeed benefit both the state of Maryland and the United States Department of Defense. Now, it doesn't take much uh, to think about that whatever we accomplished uh, are just a couple of chess moves away from advancing civilian health, potentially global health. Now, I want to thank Troy, Artie, and the good men and women of MII and TEDCO for their strong collaborative spirit. We at HGF are, we aim to be worthy partners, and I can assure you HGF will do everything in its power to achieve the goals we set here today. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you the CEO of TEDCO, Maryland's economic engine for technology companies, Mr. Troy Lamel Stovall. Greetings, good afternoon. I promise you I'm the last one you're gonna probably hear from. I don't have slides. I'm barely scripted, as Tammy knows. And so I just wanna thank you all for being here this afternoon. Uh, we've used the word ecosystem a lot today, a lot. And as I think about that, Joe, you know, if you think about the organic definition, that's about organisms working and living together in a symbiotic way. But what we're talking about here today is about how we all can come together to make a better Maryland, right? That's what it's about. How do we take our individualisms and create a togetherism? And I, I, grew, up, um, I grew up in Houston, Texas. I actually did a little work at uh, the uh, NASA Space Center there. And, and so I want to be an astronaut. So I, I talk in those terms. And so as I think about what an ecosystem is, LaShawn, I think about this notion of orbits colliding and how orbits can collide. And when they collide, they create a new celestial body. And that new celestial body has a greater gravitational constant than the ones and how they then attract one another, Bob, and creating something even greater. And so as I think of what we're trying to do here at TechCo and what we're doing here today, and again, thank you, Joe, and thank you, LaShawn, and all those here to bring together, and Artie, thank you for your leadership with MII. It's about how do we bring together that, Bob, so that we can scale differently, so we can bring together things that before couldn't come together, so that we can tell a better story, and most importantly, as you talked about, Bob, because you had that great picture of all these great resources here in Maryland, but we haven't brought them together in a scale. So to have, Joe, you and your organization be an active part of this, the whole point of all of that is so that we can create a higher level of stickiness for those companies that are started, growing, and scaling in Maryland. That's what this is about today. How do we bring together resources that but for what together? That's the collision. And by the way, we have this effort 
here at TechCo that we're going to be leading called Cultivate. If you go Google TechCo Cultivate, you'll see about it. It's an effort to really think differently for Maryland to scale differently. For the, for the private sector to come together with the public sector, the philanthropic sector, the federal sector say, we can have a better Maryland because we have all those great resources. And how do we bring them together? Because cultivate, again, back to definition of words, cultivate means to prepare, to get the soil together, to get it together so that you can get, grain a better crop. And that better crop is high, high, very high growth, a lot of great jobs, a lot of great technology companies for the state of Maryland. So thank you all today for being here today. I think it's time, Joe, to sign some documents. And let's get at it. <laughs>